it, so I don't know what session we're on anymore. I, I didn't look which number this is, so we'll, when I put it online, it'll we'll, have the right number on it, hopefully. So we're going to talk about tonight, we're going to talk about perfection as a rite of passage in, uh, in the life of believers. And then from that, we'll seg into Christians being uh, co-priests with Christ and how that theme runs throughout Hebrews, and as well as how that theme has been, theme has been a part of Lutheranism uh, since the beginning uh, when when. Luther started writing about the priesthood of all believers, and then we'll talk about exactly what he meant by that, because uh, like a lot of things Luther said, it got misinterpreted, and people kind of ran with it in some directions they maybe shouldn't have. Uh, so we'll talk about that. So we'll just begin with, uh, the beginning part of this is going to be listening to me talk, sorry about that. Oh, yeah. So we're talking about perfection as a rite of passage, and there's these four stages uh, the first stage, uh, each one of these stages has uh, a, what, what? What section are we referring to? Don't know. I haven't got, we haven't, we're going to be all over tonight. All over this, Hebrews? Yeah. Okay. yeah. This is one of those permeating themes that's going to go around. So around chapter two to start. Thank you. But in each one of these, each one of these uh, groups of people, I guess we should call it, each one of these four groups of people, there's going to be a preliminary state, a rite of passage, a final state. I think we did actually do this a little bit before. And then uh, it's going to tell you what you wind up with at the end of this. So the first one, the preliminary state is going to be God's firstborn son with priestly status. And the rite of passage is going to be preparation for ministry through suffering which begins in baptism. And then the final state or the goal will be Christ is anointed high priest and king. And what we wind up with is Jesus as the perfecter and author of faith. So again, this is just a concept. This is an idea. We're not going to talk about it any more than just putting those words into our head to kind of keep in mind, uh, like Jesus is the perfecter of faith or how Jesus' suffering starts with Jesus' ministry starts with suffering, uh, beginning in his baptism, and then moving forward. And guess what? The life of a baptized Christian is the same way. You are baptized. You receive the Holy Spirit. You become knowledgeable of the fact that you are a sinner. And then you have that two natures that's going to fight against each other your whole life, the saint and the sinner, so that you have that struggle. Uh, so you're going to see how our life then mirrors, in a small way, the life of Christ. <clears throat> So this one, we'll look at, we're just going to cherry pick a few verses here and there to kind of whet our appetite for getting back into this. So Hebrews 2.10 says, For it was fitting for him, Jesus, for whom are all things, and through him all things, in whom, let's try this again, I can't read tonight. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through sufferings. Okay, so speaking about God sending his son to suffer. And then chapter 5, verses 7, 7 through 10. In the days of his flesh, he offered up both prayers and supplications with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from the things which he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So I suppose we ought to talk about Melchizedek a minute. So what's the order of Melchizedek? Who knows about Melchizedek? We talked about him being both... Uh... The king and the priest. Right. His dual role. Right. So Melchizedek is one of those rare kings that also has kind of priestly status, which we only know because it's been told to us in scriptures, because that story of when he came out to Moses. Am I getting this wrong again? Moses. Moses. Melchizedek. No, Moses. I it was Abram. 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 Why do I do this backwards every time? 
Can you tell I wrote a paper about Melchizedek? Wow. So. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, Abram was a mighty general before he was the father of nations. And so he went and he was a general in this war for these kings to help push back the oppressors that were surrounding them all. And basically the short story we have about Melchizedek is Abram sitting there and Melchizedek, the king of Salem, which is later Jerusalem, comes out to him. Kings don't do that, right? You go to the king, you bow and prostrate prostrate yourself before the king. The king doesn't come to you, and he certainly doesn't serve you lunch. So Melchizedek comes out, sits with Abram, blesses him as a priest does, and then feeds him as a servant would, uh, and serves him of all things bread and wine. So we probably don't have to put too much of a stress on what that points forward to, as Christ, our priest and king, gives us every blessing and feeds us with his own body and blood. So Christ is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who is this priest and king who brings his blessings out to the people. And that's really all we know about Melchizedek, although they've written books about him because it's just kind of fascinating to have this enigmatic character. Okay, chapter Hebrews 7.28 says... For the law appoints men as high priests who are weak, but the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son made perfect forever. And this is, again, after this entire chapter is about Jesus being a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. It goes on and on about it. So when we get to chapter 7, we'll talk about it in more detail. But the, the point is the, the former priests... They were men, so men die. So you have to make more priests because the priests keep dying because they are not immortal. However, Christ is our high priest forever because he is God. Uh, So he goes on. So he is anointed as high priest and king forever. There never has to be another Christ because he is, you know, of course, God. And then chapter 12, 2 says... Um, as Jesus being our example, we fix, fixing our eyes on Jesus starts up, picks up in the middle of the sentence. Verse numbers don't always make sense. Let's go to back to the beginning of uh, verse 1. And this is a passage we've heard in church not long ago. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And we heard that in the as the grad, or, uh, yeah, that was the uh, uh, gradual for most of Lent, the better part of Lent. So we heard that uh, as the gradual between the uh, Old Testament and the Epistle reading. And so again, talks about him being, you know, the one who is the author and perfecter of faith. Uh, And so he endured the endured the cross and sat down again at the right hand of the throne of God. So he is enthroned as high priest and king. Then you have another theme that is going to run through uh, Hebrews that we will see, where the initial state is. Um, an infant immaturity without discernment. And that's something we talked about in um, confirmation when we talked about discerning the the body and blood in the bread and wine. Do you always wear glasses? Okay. Only with small print. Okay. It's like, you're very different with glasses. Um, All girls look better with glasses, I'm just saying. Sure. <laughs> so, you mean all this? It was an aside. What? I'm just trying to figure out what you're talking about. Was there... Glasses. Because so. I wear them every time at Bible study. Pastor Steve has not noticed until today. 
<laughs> no, I have not. Thank you. So, what was I talking about? Jesus. This has got to be very... Yes, we were talking about Jesus. So the, the next state, uh, preliminary state, where we can see a change in the life of a Christian is how we begin with uh, an infant immaturity where we don't discern the things of God. You know, when we're children or young of faith, uh, we don't discern the things that we are able to discern. Excuse me. We cannot discern the things we're able to discern after we're taught that there's something there to see. We're, or you could call it spiritual spiritual blindness. So the rite of passage is training, being taught. And the final state is adult maturity, where we have spiritual discernment. We don't know everything yet. We don't claim to know everything. In fact, we, if anything, our spiritual maturity is acknowledging how much we don't know and understand. But we're able to discern spiritual things as opposed to earthly things and start to see the difference in our lives of things that are only of this world and things that will serve the world to come. In other words, serving our neighbor and therefore helping others to know Christ. So the object we're looking for is catechumens, students, students of the word. And we see that starting in 5, verse 11 through 6, 3. So we have a little large, larger section to read there. So whoever would like to read, other than me, can read that. It's not very long. Starting in chapter 5, verse 11, going to 6, 3. About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the element, uh, elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of instruction about washings, the laying of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Okay, and this we will do if God permits so that is talking about the teachers kind of growing in their discernment so they can teach others so that, you know, God willing, they are able to do this thing to, to lay on hands, to turn people to repentance, uh, to get people to be able to move past the milk and start hungering for more solid food of doctrine. Uh, although, as Christ says, uh, you know, the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who believe as a child. Child, children are, start out on milk. You've got to start with the basics. And then it gets more complicated after that. And then we find the more we start to understand, the more we realize we don't understand, the more we realize, yeah, you know, we really ought to stick to the milk sometimes, I think, than the meat. Okay, the next one is going to be about, because we're Luther, it's going to be about conscience. So we're going to start with unclean people who have a bad conscience. And the rite of passage is going to be cleansing, which is a theme that runs throughout the Bible. This one is cleansing in the blood of Christ, uh, which is going to you know, cleanse that conscience, lift that burden, so that the final state are people of faith who are able to come near to God, not because of what they do, but because they realize God has drawn them to himself. So with that final state, we're going to have people with clean consciences, people who realize they have access to God. So look at chapter 7, verse 19, which says, For the law may actually, I'm going to go back to verse 18. For on the one hand, there is a setting aside of a former commandment because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. And on the other hand, there's a bringing in of a better hope through which we now draw near to God. So that is, if you have nothing but the law, all that's going to do is keep killing you. Right? You have to have that word of gospel. 
and then chapter 10, 1, which says, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year after year make perfect those who draw near. So in that verse, they're talking about how the old covenant passed away, the old system of sacrifice, which they had to make those sacrifices year after year after year. Every year you had to make the uh, Day of Atonement. You had to lay the sins of the people on the scapegoat and send it into the desert to die for the sins of Israel. Well, you don't have to do that anymore because Jesus came. He was the once for all sacrifice on the cross for the sins of all men that have ever lived, that are going to live, that are still living. Uh, and with that, that old system ended. Now the last one, and this is going to lead into the next sec section we're going to talk about. In the preliminary state, you'll have people that are just ordinary, everyday people. And the rite of passage will be consecration. And we talked about that in the last couple of sessions where we talked about being consecrated as priests and how the Old Testament priests were consecrated to be priests and how Jesus himself underwent consecration. So now we'll talk about as our rite of passage is consecration by Jesus and by his body so that our final state is service with Jesus as a high priestly people, not high priests, but a high priestly people who have a heavenly calling. And so in our final state, we will be Christ's brothers. We'll look there at uh, 1014, which says, For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And compare that with chapter 2, verses 10 to 12, if somebody would like to read those. And also verse 17, so 2, 10 to 12, and 17. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And 17. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make the propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Okay. I'm just looking at something up real quick. Okay, and then that, that quote from, from the Old Testament that has there, I will proclaim your name to my brethren in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. That's Psalm 22, 22. Anybody know how Psalm 22 starts? What the first 22, 1 says, without looking? Knowing we just came out of, you know, Easter and Lent. What that might be. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Same Psalm. And my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? For far from my deliverance are the words of my agonizing. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I have no rest. But then it has all this other stuff toward the end. And it's an interesting psalm that we should maybe sit and talk about that whole psalm one day. Okay, so you have all of these purifications that are taking place in Christian life. So that's, that's this theme of purification. <clears throat> Actually, there's a couple more. Um, the next one is those who start their earthly life as slaves to the devil, which is all of us. And our rite of passage is, one guess, what's our rite of passage? To no longer be slaves to the devil. Baptism. Kind of. Baptism is a precursor to the ultimate. 
Oh, so is that being catechized and being taking the Lord's Supper? Nope, it's actually death, like actually physically dying. So okay. our earthly life, we are slaves to the devil because it's his world, right? He's the prince of this world. Now in our baptism, we die to our sinful nature, even though we're still sinful. And that doesn't go away until we die, until we physically die. Uh, so our rite of passage in this one is actually death. That's our f end of our physical life. But then our final state, then that one's a little easy. So what's our final state? We physically die. What will be our final state then? Glorified bodies with Christ. Right. So you're going to be in heaven at the heavenly worship service that without end but then there will be the new earth will be reunited with our body which will be perfect like his is perfect so the final state of all this will be our glorified lives okay so the end result is we're god's sons and we can see that in 210 which we've read already twice we don't have to read it again but that's for it was fitting through him who are through him through all things, and through him are all things, and bringing many sons to glory. And then 12.5. Which says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. And also... Verse 7, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And verse 8, but if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. And then verse 23, uh, which is to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven and to God the judge of all and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect. So in the end of all of that, we're being prepared to be glorified as he is glorified. And then finally, the last uh, concept of cleansing and perfection that goes on in our lives is we look at our beginning state and what we are are aliens in this world. Okay? Okay. So the rite of passage, if we're aliens in this world, that mean, must mean that our home is another world. So aliens in this world journey to their homeland, and which is God's city, and that begins with baptism. So our journey home begins with the washing of renewal of water and the word. So that the final state we wind up as is recipients of the royal inheritance that belongs to us, as citizens of that heavenly city. What if you're, what if you're not baptized? <clears throat> what if you're not baptized? I mean, I don't mean like you rejecting it. You just weren't. If you reject your baptism? No. no or you reject anything. You just were never baptized. Oh, yeah. If you were never baptized, you I mean, you can still be saved. It's just that baptism is that outward sign that others can see, oh, yeah, you were baptized. We were there. We saw it. Uh, but you do not. You do not have to be baptized to be saved. No. 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 So you know, baptism not saved. You know, like baptism not saves you, as Peter says. Um, but then it says, "He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe is condemned." It doesn't say he who does not believe and is not baptized. So no, you don't have to be baptized. But why wouldn't you want to do that, basically? Um, so, as you go through the baptized life, then you will no longer be an alien in this world, but you will be at home in that other world to which we belong, and as, again, as sons, as co-heirs. And that's a bunch of verses in Hebrews talk about that. Uh, but probably... The big one to look at, let's look at if somebody wants to read 1140 to 122. That's only three verses. And two of them we've already read once. So.
But these key verses will keep coming up, so we'll have we'll probably a lot of them. Even if we don't have to memorize chapter and verse, you're going to know immediately when you hear these words, like, since therefore we have so great a cloud of witnesses. We hear that, we're going to know Hebrews when this is all done. Uh, so if somebody wants to read 1140 to 1220. Since God has provided something better for us, that apart from us they sh- should not be made perfect, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight in sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Yep. And the next verse. Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy was set before him and did the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So we're going to have these, these themes that are going to keep running through. They're all going to be about alienness to going home or being a child to being mature, to being a, you know, forsaken kind of piece of filth to being a beloved child or a beloved brother or for being just ordinary and common to being a brother of Christ. So we'll keep having these ideas of a rite of passage that are going to continue through the book. Now you don't have to, you don't really have to be brought to be baptized by your parents necessarily. No. My parents took care of foster children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've actually told that story before. And and then the Jewish faith community had too many children and didn't have enough people, so they put a little Jewish boy with my parents. Okay. Now, he wasn't going to live too long because he had both sexes. So they said he wouldn't live too long. So my mother said to my dad, well, you have to baptize this child. So he did. Okay. Now, you know, at least they were satisfied. And he was, and we prayed for him all the time, so... I think the Lord took them. Sure. Absolutely. And, you know, and that's, you know, really that is for, I gotta be careful how I say this. I mean, baptism does what it says it does. So you become a child of God. You know, you are saved. Uh, but the outward ceremony of that is for us yeah. to go, yeah. I know, I am confident that baby went to heaven because I saw him get baptized mm-hmm. and I know what that means. Um, you know, so again, you don't have to be, but we, it, because a lot of times it's like you say, when there's a child that's, you know, let's say a child is just born in the hospital. He's not going to make it. He maybe has hours and dad baptizes him right there at the sink yeah. in the, in the delivery room. Well, okay. You did that outward thing because it does what it says it does. And those parents saw that we did this. We can rest assured that that baby went to heaven because that's what Jesus says happens. You know, so it does what it says it does, but that's for our own. Yeah. Just as if you could, you would pray, and that baby would go where you prayed it would. You would hope it went, but it, you don't have that outward sign where people we like things you can see. You know, you, your hands get wet. You you do things. That's why we you know we eat bread, we drink wine because you can taste it. Uh, because otherwise it's what's going on that we have senses then we like those senses to be stimulated so we understand what's happening so yeah we do other things we do out outwardly so that we can be assured because we saw it happen right not just throwing that out there it's not kind of apropos or nothing but okay we resemble both the old covenant priests and we also differ from them significantly. And we're going to talk about a couple of those things because it's kind of fun. And it's another one of those themes of us being co-priests with Christ, especially in the book of Hebrews. So the first one we're going to talk about is how are the people of the new covenant, us, like Israel as a liturgical community? So liturgical community, people that go to church, right, and go to service. And... We'll probably look at, I mean, if you guys want to, what, what, hmm. I'm thinking if we should read something first, make this easier. We did read some of this stuff before, but it's been a while. Look at, 
Well, I think the stuff we looked at before was how the priests were consecrated. That will help us. Yeah, that was really long. Yeah, was that too? Well, because it repeated. Oh, I'm sorry. It's because it repeated <laughs> itself. Because it gave you the directions, and then it showed them going through the directions, and then it talked about the directions again. It's like it has to do it three times. And it's like, yeah, I heard you the first time you said it. I had a speech professor that said, first you tell them what you want to tell them, then you tell them what you tell them, and then you tell, tell them, them what you, you just tell them. Yeah. 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 yeah, I don't think we were in that again. Actually, the, maybe the way to do this is to throw out to you guys, and we could do it as an exercise. All the ways we are the same and different and see if you can find them. And I'll point you in the general vicinity of where we can find that. So we're going to talk about, look at different ways. The people, we are like Israel as liturgical community. The second one will be how are Christians like the Levites who served at the tabernacle and at the temple? And then how are Christians like the priests serving at the altar? And then... How do Christians resemble the high priest who presided in the divine service of the Old Covenants? And then how do Christians surpass the Old Testament people of Israel, the Levites, the priests, and the high priest? You answer the last one, but not the others. Yeah. So I'm going to point you in the general vicinity of the vicinity of... We know you're going to be in Leviticus. So look at Leviticus 21 is a good one. And Exodus 29. And Leviticus, now Leviticus 8, you don't want to get bogged down into again. Leviticus 9. So I'm going to give you Leviticus 9, Leviticus 21, and Leviticus 9, Leviticus 21, and... Maybe Exodus 19. Yeah. So what we basically we have to do, we have to look at the actions of the priests and so forth. And draw parallels? Yeah, and look at how do, how do they resemble us and how are they different from us. Ah, uh, compare and contrast. Wonderful. Yes. You know you've made it as a teacher when you can finally ask it. Compare and contrast the New Testament Christian to the Old Testament Levitical priests. Your, your answer will consist of five parts. You must pick three. No, that's your science crazy teacher. That was Dr. Jekka. There are five questions. You must pick three. Each question has seven subparts of which you must pick five. After 20 minutes, after you understood the directions to the test, you could actually start that. Luckily, they were all take-homes, which took like 20, 22 hours to finish. Oh, is this a take-home? Oh, uh, no. Yeah, it can be partially. What did I say? Leviticus what? Leviticus 9. 9 and 21. 21? Okay. Yeah, here we go. Let's look at... Yeah. 21, Leviticus 21 and 22 and 23 is good enough. There's three chapters of Levit Leviticus alone should probably get you through some of this stuff. Did I say 19? I said 21. No, you said Exodus 19. Okay, yeah. Exodus 19. No, holiness. Okay. Because either that or I could just read through all the answers, but that's not going to help you. That was anyway. an option? You didn't give that to yeah, yeah, i got all this stuff written out for pages. I just can't give it all to you. Make photocopies. I could do that. I can not I can barely read my own writing this many weeks later. Yep, so, remember the first one was, how are the people of the New Covenant like Israel as a liturgical community? And then it 
temples, the temple keepers, the altar priests, and the high priests. Yeah. You know what I might do? Because if I just put, if I just give you guys a, a scavenger hunt through Leviticus, you're gonna be hating me in about 15 minutes. If you're not hating, hating me already, I think I am gonna make copies of this for you. So people at home. I will scan these notes and put them online for you to download. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to give them copies of this real quick because you're, you're going to be mad. I actually have all the verses for where I specifically look. Otherwise, you're going to be hunting through half the book of Leviticus. I don't like reading Leviticus. It gets a little long. I like Leviticus. What is he talking about? Yeah, but if you like He's going to give us the where to look exactly. In Leviticus and stuff. He's giving us his notes so we can study and well, then answer the question. Now the next test is reading his handwriting. Who's what? Reading his handwriting yep. is the next test. I don't think it's that bad. That's <laughs> because you know how to read. I like her, except when she hits me on something. A killer. Hmm? A killer? What time is it? Oh, we've got another 15 minutes. Well, we can't answer all those questions. Speaking of handwriting, my very first teaching job as a sub in Cleveland. Okay. I replaced a sub that was. In, I took over class in the afternoon from another sub. <laughs> And the principal, uh, Miss Ungar, who came to sc the school on a broom, uh, <laughs> she walked in my classroom and said, Mr. West, your handwriting, it's terrible. Bad all the students. All the students. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, thank you. Yeah. It's really a way to bolster my authority, right? <laughs> I'm a sub to begin with, thanks. <laughs> of course, this is an all-black classroom. It makes it fourth and fifth graders. Oh, they're fifth and sixth graders. I'm sorry. Fifth and sixth. Oh, that getting to middle school. school. At least it was in high school. That would have been worse. <laughs> yeah. My head is stretching. Tight. Mine looks like a third graders. I can read it, but it's a third graders. I was abbreviated, so. But it looks like a third graders handwriting. I got a D in penmanship, so my one bad grade was well one now. I used to get C minus economic. You'll notice I chose professions that don't require writing. <laughs> well, I I got through law school tape, taping on a, a mini computer, mm -hmm. and people just hated me because it was so easy to study. You know, I could reorganize my notes, cut and paste, make a nice outline. But I couldn't imagine having to take notes by hand in law school. That would have been horrible. I would have been so sunk. <laughs> I had a prophet came <coughs> over to the state that he wrote on the board with one hand, talked about something else. He talked and wrote what he talked about on the board, but he was talking about something else already and erasing with the other hand. There were about 600 of us in this class. Oh, that's just cool. Yeah, you couldn't keep up with that. Sounds like your mumbling human calculator. It looks like a good old lefty. Huh? You're a lefty that writes with fountain pens. Yeah, what about? What's wrong with lefties? Nothing. My mom's a lefty. I'm a lefty. Oh no, I I don't even know. Yes, I do. Oh, you do. Why don't you? I can always borrow the real book. <laughs> Guess I get one in. Oh, I got every other word. Is that <laughs> Oh, I'm going to up here, didn't I? 
Okay. He so, left there. I left my book in the top here. the new covenant like Israel as a liturgical community all right the Israelites were God's people and God's household just as Christians are God's people and they are also part of God's household so I've got some passages there from Leviticus and Numbers showing you about the Israelites and then from Hebrews about uh, us, us. So how do you want to go through this? you want to just go through it all? Or do you want to go through the Hebrews verses? Or what makes sense? I don't know. I'm not sure which way is most effective. So. It would probably make sense to see how it is in the Old Testament compared to the New Testament. Yeah, and you guys can read the Hebrews passages on your own as an exercise. How about that? Since you got it all written down. Okay. okay. So, All right, so the Israelites are like God's people. And God's household, we look at Leviticus 26, 12. Which says, I will also walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. Pretty straightforward. And then Numbers 12, 7. Which says, little context then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent and he called Aaron and Miriam and they came forward and then God spoke to them hear now my words if there's a prophet among you I the Lord shall make myself known to him in a vision I will speak with him in a dream but not so with my servant Moses he is faithful in all my household with him I speak mouth to mouth so it's different Moses is different than the others because God speaks to him person to person has it. Wasn't he the only one? He was the only one. Okay. Yeah, he's the one that had shiny skin because of it. <laughs> but Christians are God's people, and you can see that looking in the different um, Hebrews passages that I listed for you. But then the Israelites presented their offerings to God. Well, guess what? We present our offerings to God as well. But we do not offer them, and here's how it's different, we do not offer them as the priests did. We offer them differently, and you'll look at the differences there. So Israel presented their offerings to God, Leviticus 17.5. Which says, the reason is so, I guess context again, this is talking about the blood for the atonement of the people. This is what the Lord has commanded, saying, any man from the house of Israel who slaughters an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or who slaughters it outside the camp and has not brought it to the doorway of the tent of meeting to present it as an offering to the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, blood guiltiness is to be reckoned to that man. He has shed blood. And that man shall be cut off from his among, his among the people. The reason is so that the sons of Israel may bring their sacrifices, which they were sacrificing in the open field, that they may bring them into the Lord at the doorway of the tents of meeting to the priest and sacrifice them as sacrifices of peace offerings to the Lord. The priest shall sprinkle the blood, etc., etc. So the difference is. And you can look up the other passages uh, to see how the priests do it in Leviticus 21. But basically what you did is you brought your sacrifice to the priest. And the priest 
offered the sacrifice for you. You didn't sacrifice it. You didn't walk up to the altar and go chop, you know, burn. You weren't allowed to do that. You had to bring your offering to the priest. The priest then offered it on the altar, right? Now, right, the intercessor, as it were. Now, you don't give your offerings to me and then I offer them to God. You give your offerings to God. Period. I don't offer them to God on behalf of the people. We don't have some ceremony or prayer that you say. You just walk up with the offerings and you put them on the altar or put them in the office at the end of the service as we do now since we don't touch everybody's offering until that goes away. But you, you put it on the altar. Everybody's together as equals. Okay, so you can read about those differences for how the priests have to do all the offering. Well, first they had to make offerings for themselves because they couldn't offer on behalf of the people until they were cleansed. So they had to offer their sin offering for themselves. And then they could bring the offerings of the people. And if they couldn't do that, well, the people's offerings went unoffered. So they had a job to do. Okay, and then the, the next one is, okay, the Israelites needed a priest to make atonement. And you should read about the Day of Atonement uh, specifically, uh, which is the actual... Day of Atonement. So we'll read about that one because that's important. And that's what we'll, we'll leave off tonight is we will read Leviticus 16 because that's important for us to look at. But this next difference is, okay, you needed the, just as you needed the priests to make the offerings, they needed to make atonement for the sins of the people. So the people, I'm at uh, number 1C is where I'm at now. So this is... The, well, the high priest has to make the atonement for the sins of the people, as we'll read about going into the Holy of Holies and, and doing that whole thing. Just as we need Christ as our high priest to make atonement for the sins of the world. So we need him as the high priest to make that once for all atonement. So again, the Lamb of God, that's why he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God that took away the sins of the people had to be sacrificed every year. You had to put the sins on the scapegoat and send them out. So let's read about that. Because it's good to refresh our memory. We know all this stuff from kid, when we were kids. We read about it, you heard about it, and then you don't read it again. And so you vaguely know there was something about the Day of Atonement and something the priest had to do. And if he screwed it up, he was probably going to die. And that's about all we remember. So let's look at Leviticus 16. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron. What did the two sons of Aaron did that caused them to die, by the way? Ever remember that? Isn't that the one? Didn't they offer impure? Yeah. They offered impure fire. So they're like, oh, we're just going to offer this. We're just going to offer this sacrifice to God because we're priests now. And God killed them because they were not supposed to do that at that time. And he was pretty strict about that stuff. What were they supposed to do? Hmm? What were they supposed to do? They were supposed to do it when and how they were told to do it. And so they just like, oh, we're just going to offer this sacrifice because we think it's a good idea. And God's like, yeah, don't do that. Yeah, it was like uh, God was awfully smitey in the Old Testament because, again, why was God so smitey? I'm kind of making light of it saying that, but why was God so strict with his people in the Old Testament? Because they had to be held apart because they were the, the root of Jesus. And right. So, it, it so, was a, so you had to keep okay. these people separate. And they had to look different from everybody else right from getting their speckle smacked when they're eight days old. Okay, so circumcision instantly makes them look different than every other guy when they go to the bath or whatever, or go to wrestle or work or what have you. And then they have to do all, they have to eat these weird foods and they can't do this and they can't do that and they gotta wear their hair weird and they gotta pray at weird times. They have to act weird from the rest of the world. Why? Because they're different because that's where the Lamb of God who's gonna take away the sin of the world is gonna come from. So as soon as he came, you don't got to do all that stuff anymore. That's another story, and we'll get to that. Okay, so 
The Lord said to Moses, tell your brother Aaron that he shall not enter at any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, or he will die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. Okay, the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, the two cherubim, their wings are folded in, pointing to the center. So right in that center spot was called the mercy seat. The glory cloud would come down, the presence of the Lord would sit on it, behind the curtain, away from the eyes of the people. And only the high priest could go in there, as we'll read. You will enter the holy place with this, with a bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen, Holy linen tunic and the linen undergarment shall be next to his body. He should be girdled with the linen sash and attired with the linen turban. These are holy garments. Then he shall bathe his body in water and put them on. He shall take from the congregation of the sons of Israel two male goats for sin offering and one ram for the burnt offering. Then Aaron shall offer the bull for the sin offering, which is for himself, that he may make atonement for himself and for his household. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the goat on which the lot for the Lord fell and make it a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot for the scapegoat fell shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it, to send it into the wilderness as the scapegoat. Then Aaron shall offer the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his household. And he shall slaughter the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself. He shall take a fire pan full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord and two handfuls of finely ground sweet incense and bring it inside the veil. He shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the ark of the testimony. Otherwise he will die. Moreover, he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. Also in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall slaughter the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, and bring its blood inside the veil, and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. He shall make atonement for the holy place because of the impurities of the son of Israel and because of their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And thus he shall do for the tent of meeting, which abides with them in the midst of their impurities. When he goes in to make atonement in the holy place, no one shall be in the tent of meeting until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself and for his household and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and of the blood of the goats and put it on the horns of the altar on all sides. With his finger, he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it seven times and cleanse it and from the impurities of the sons of Israel, consecrate it. When he finishes atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Then Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. The goat shall bear on it itself all their iniquities to a solitary land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tent of meeting and take off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place, and he shall leave them there. He shall bathe his body with water in a holy place and put on his clothes and come forth and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people and make atonement for himself and for the people. Then he shall offer up in the smoke of the fat of the sin of the offering on the altar. The one who released the goat as the scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his body with water. Then afterward he shall come into the camp. But the bull of the sin offering and the goat of the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be taken outside the camp, and they shall burn their hides, their flesh, and their refuse in the fire. Then the one who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body with water. Then afterward he shall come into the camp. This shall be a permanent statute for you in the seventh month on the tenth day of the month. You shall humble your souls and not do any work, whether the native or the alien who sojourns among you. For it is on this day that atonement shall be made for you to cleanse you. You will be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is to be a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, that you may humble your souls. It is a permanent statute. So the priest who is anointed and ordained to serve as priest in his father's place shall make atonement. He shall thus put on the linen garments, the holy garments, and make atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make atonement for the tent of meeting and for the altar. He shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. 
Now you have this as a permanent statute to make atonement for the sons of Israel and all their sins once every year. And just as the Lord had commanded Moses, so he did. And there's more rules and regulations and goes on from there in chapters 17 and 18. And there's more law and regulations for the people of Israel. What were we talking about? Oh, so they had to have a high priest to atone for their sins. They couldn't do it on their own. They couldn't approach God. We saw that with Aaron's sons. Even Aaron's sons couldn't approach God and offer sacrifices that were not according to the law. That cost them their lives. So they had to have the high priest. And he had to do it in a certain way. Even the high priest could die. That's why when he used to go into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, he would tie a rope around his waist they had to go all the way outside because the tent of meeting had to be empty. He would go into the Holy of Holies, and if he did something and screwed up and died, then they could not go into the Holy of Holies to get his body because then they would die. Okay, so they would drag his body out of the Holy of Holies by the rope. That's what the rope was for. So it's a tough gig being the high priest. You had a lot of stuff to do. And if he didn't do it right, the sins of the people were not atoned for. And you might think, wow, it's a whole lot easier now. Is it really? Because Jesus had to die. So yeah, we don't have to do this every year, but look at the cost. But yes, we don't have all these rules and regulations. If I want, if you want to go to God with your sin and ask for forgiveness, you can talk to him. You don't have to go through me. Or like the Roman Catholics think, you have to go through the priest to attain forgiveness. Yes, as a called and ordained servant, I have the power to forgive your sins. I have the I have the call to forgive your sins. But you can ask for them on your own. You know, you don't have to have a priest who offers sacrifices so that your sins can be forgiven. Jesus did that once for everybody, and now it's done. Okay, so don't need a priest to make atonement because Jesus, our high priest, has made atonement once for all. Okay, so the Old Testament Israelites and the last similarity are, we're talking about how are the people of the New Covenant like Israel as a liturgical community? Well, the Israelites approached God in the Old Covenant divine service. And it's like, well, what was the Old Covenant divine service? And we're not going to get into all those details. Read the book of Leviticus if you want all the details. At length. In excruciating detail. But it's good stuff to read once in a while to refresh your memory of all those things and why they had to do them. Uh, so that when you see people talking about similar things in the New Testament, you can understand why they were confused. Because generations of them for hundreds of years had to follow these rules. And now all of a sudden they didn't have to. And I'm like, well, it's hard to just stop doing that. It's like, I'm not going to eat unclean animals. I've never eaten an unclean animal before now. And I'm not about to start, Peter said. When Jesus, you know, God came to him in a vision and said, oh, yes, you will, because you're not going to call stuff dirty that is unclean that I have said is now clean. And as we all know, shrimp and bacon taste good. So look at Leviticus 9.5. So they took what Moses had commanded to the front of the tent of meeting, and the whole congregation came near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded you to do, that the glory of the Lord may appear to you. And then it goes on, because basically he called them forward and said, This is what we have to do, and this is what we're going to do. And then they do all the sacrifices. So they came to the tent of meeting, to Moses and Aaron, and then Moses offered the sacrifices back in Leviticus 7 and later, the high priests, what we just got done reading. So you came forward to the tent of meeting and you witnessed the sacrifices being made for you. And we do the same thing. We approach God in our own divine service, Hebrews 10, 22, and that's where we'll leave it for tonight. Hebrews 10, 22 says, somewhere, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And that's not... Literal language, we're not literally walking through a bath or going through a ritual 
uh, washing, as the Jews had to do. But we come through with a sincere heart, with a conscience washed figuratively clean in Christ's blood, right? Our consciences have been cleansed in reality, but in, in, a, in a metaphorical, literal washing of water with the blood of Christ washes us clean. So we can come and approach God without fear. We don't have to worry about being strick, stricken down because we didn't pray right or we didn't offer our offerings right. We're not under a penalty for, there's no, none of those laws apply to us. So we can come free and clear right to God and go, okay, I need help with this or I thank and praise you for that. But we're allowed to approach. You know, we don't have any of those obstacles to that. We don't have an intercessor. We have to go through Christ as our only intercessor. So that's how we're the same. We draw near to God just as they did, but we're different because we don't have to go through that in a mirror area that's blocking the door. They literally prevented them from going into the tent or what have you. They're standing there doing what they have to do later at the temple. And that's where we'll end for today. So next week we'll look at number two and the rest, but how are Christians like the Levites who served at the temple? So we've looked at the priests. How are, or I'm sorry. Yeah, how are, how are we like the priests and different than, from the priests? that serve. Next week, we'll look at the Levites. All priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. So these are members of the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe, but they're not all priests. They take turns at different times, they're priests. And then other times they have other duties. So we'll look at that. How are we the same as them? And how are we different? Because the the biggest theme we're gonna see in Hebrews is talking, is really this, this royal priesthood how Christ makes us a different thing than we were before. But that thing looks like remarkably like God's people in the Old Covenant, but remarkably different too. So we'll look at that. That's where we'll, we'll stop tonight. I know that was a lot of stuff kind of circling a little bit to find where we left off from last time, but I think we're on track now. So we will talk about some of this time, some of this stuff next time, and after next time, then we'll probably get back into going, okay, chapter 3, verse 1, and we'll go through it from there. But this stuff's all important to get that those images and that language in our head because that writer from the, of the, the writer to the Hebrews is drawing on all of that imagery. Uh, to bring that to mind, and of course, the new Christians in, in the New Testament era would be a lot more familiar with that stuff than we are because they were living it just a few years before. Yep, so we'll stop there. Any questions or anything? Okay, we will end there for tonight and then we'll pick up next week.